Kristen, I'm so thrilled to have you here today. Um, and I hope you're enjoying learning about um, UNW. We're so excited to get a freshman class and for in-person classes and for seeing all your wonderful faces. Um, it's gonna be a great year next year. And um, I hope you choose to come to Mary Washington. Today, um, I am a professor in the Department of Psychological Science. And I've been teaching at Mary Washington since 2001, so 20 years, which is crazy. Um, and today we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a little lecture that um, is derived from a lecture I would give in my general psychology class. You may have some knowledge of these topics, which is wonderful. Um, if you've taken psychology, AP psychology or psychology in high school um, and, but, it's always good to, to learn them. And, and if you don't, you're gonna learn some interesting things today about behaviorism. So we are gonna talk about operant conditioning and talk about why we behave. So let's see if I can get this to move forward. Excellent. So what is operant conditioning? Operant conditioning is the type of conditioning that we use, for example, to train dogs and really to train people. Does anyone have, if you have any pets that you've ever trained, Throw that in the chat. We can talk about that. If anyone has any, has anyone ever trained a dog? Really training dogs, training humans, not that different, right? Um, operant conditioning, I'll move on, was developed by a man named B.F. Skinner. And he, how many of you have heard of, if you've heard of Skinner, excellent, right? Um, he would be, would be what is called a radical behaviorist. Now, operant conditioning in Skinner's work is different from classical conditioning. Um, and we're not gonna talk about classical conditioning today. Okay. How many of you have heard, oh, wait, I see somebody, I can only see a few faces, but I see an animal. I don't know if that's a dog. We can use all of our training, so that's awesome. Um, how many of you have heard, how, how, put in the chat, this is a question. If anyone can tell me um, what we're not gonna talk about today is classical conditioning. Anyone know who is the dude that developed classical conditioning? It's not Skinner. Who is it? Put it in the chat if you know. I'll be very impressed. You don't have to if you don't. But if you've taken some psychology, you may have heard of the other guy. <laughs> His name is, is, begins with a P. Going once, going twice. Okay, I don't see it. So that's good. So I got it, yes! Pavlov, awesome. Okay, so. Oh my God, that cat is cute. I'm getting distracted by a cute cat. Uh, <laughs> um, so Pavlov did classical conditioning. We're not gonna talk about it, but I want to tell you a little bit of the difference because um, classical conditioning, if you know anything about Pavlov, he rang a bell, then gave some food, and then the dog who would normally drool to the food learned to drool to the bell. But with classical conditioning, the, the, the thing that the, that the psychologist is providing is happening before the behavior. Does that make sense? First, there's the bell. And then there's the food or the drooling. And that is actually the opposite from operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, it's the consequences. So first you do the behavior. First you um, do your homework well or make your bed or sit, right? If you're doing dog training. And then the psychologist or the behavioral trainer provides the consequence after. It's the actions consequences. So that's a big difference between what Pavlov da, did, which um, where, where there is a stimulus, like a bell, and then a response, like drooling, and what Skinner did. Skinner is trying to shape behaviors that we can control. That's another difference. Um, for Pavlov, it's stuff like drooling or other things that you can't really control, like heart rate. Um, and so classical conditioning is more focusing on the things that we can't control, our unconscious behaviors, and operant conditioning is focusing on the things we can control, the things we do on purpose, and we do them because of the consequences of the behavior. First we do the behavior, and then we do the consequence. And why is there a picture of rats and pigeons all on this slide? It's because Skinner did most of his research with rats and pigeons. So if you think about an old fashioned psychologist, like from the fifties um, in a lab coat, he was probably a white man um, and he's running rats through the maze. That is actually a pretty accurate um, 
idea of what a psychologist was like in the 50s. Um, there was a study that um, came out that said even the rats were right. Yes, and a Skinner box. So Skinner actually um, had a lot of really radical ideas. He believed that everything in this world, all of our behaviors were shaped by the consequences. And so he developed these Skinner boxes and he believed that you should like put babies in them and then like reinforce the babies just so, and it sounds horrible and cruel, like why are we putting babies in boxes? But really his box was just like a nice little climate controlled crib that had reinforcements. So it's not as cruel as it sounds. And Skinner was really an optimist. He really believed we could create a utopian or perfect society if we could just figure out how to appropriately shape behaviors and reinforce the behaviors that we wanna reinforce. So what does all that mean? Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of this theory. Moving on. Okay, so in Skinner's theory, what we do um, is shaped by the consequences of our behavior. So we're gonna talk about two words you've probably heard before, um, reinforcement and punishment. So what reinforcement means is that is that if a behavior is reinforced, and here the dog is being reinforced by a treat, that behavior, and the dog is being really cute and sitting up and begging, becomes more likely. So reinforcement is anything that increases the likelihood of a future behavior. So if you have a dog, I'm sure you know what their favorite treat is. You can even put it in the chat. Do they like... I don't know, a dog's like peanut butter or like just regular treats. And um, if you give them the reinforcement, their behavior becomes more likely. Punishment is anything that makes the behavior become less likely, okay? Um, so here they're going, no. But let's talk, let's get some more complicated than that. So let's go. So here's another just beautiful picture of reinforcement. There's a trophy, it's, it's, strengthens or increases the probability of the response that it follows. So you do a behavior, then you get the reinforcement. And then the next time you're more likely to do the behavior again. Okay, so that's pretty simple. So let's talk about um, something called positive and negative reinforcement. Here's where psychology students across the globe get confused because psychologists talk about reinforcement that can be positive and negative. So take a minute for a second and tell me in the real world, what do you think the word positive and negative means? Just put it in the chat. If you say something is positive and negative, what do you think it means? Anyone wanna put it in the chat? Positive means good and bad. Right, Elizabeth, exactly. Um, that's what you think it means. However, I am here to tell you that in the world of operant conditioning, positive and negative do not mean good and bad. Very good, Chloe's on it. Chloe's like, no, no, I got, I got my psychology background. Um, so I like to say, I don't know if anyone has ever watched, is, has anyone watched The Princess Bride? Give me like a thumbs up or a chat. I'm like obsessed with The Princess Bride. Uh, what? No, oh, someone said no. Every time my kids cannot identify a quote from The Princess Bride, I literally tell them it is time to watch The Princess Bride again. We must watch it. They're so sick of this movie by now. But anyhow, here's a quote from The Princess Bride. Um, so if you haven't watched it, that is your homework. Um, he goes, that word, I do not, it, the word in the movie is inconceivable. And then he goes, I do not think that word means what you think it means. And that's what I want to say about um, positive and negative. It does not mean what you think it means. You think it means good and bad, but it does not. It means presented. So positive means added, presented. And negative means taken away or removed. So this is why things get tricky in psychology students and even in the media, they get this confused all the time. So let's see, say what that means. Okay, hold on, let me get this. Positive, what, positive reinforcement is very intuitive. It's the same thing as re reward. When a pleasant consequence follows a response. So you do something good, you get money, you get a treat, you get a high five, okay? And it makes the, behavior more likely to occur. Positive reinforcement is reward. It's exactly what you think when you think of reinforcement. But what could negative reinforcement be? Is negative reinforcement something we want? Anyone wanna throw in the chat what you think negative reinforcement even could possibly be? 
So let's think about it. Something is removed, but the thing that is removed is not something we want because it's still reinforcement. We want to be negatively reinforced. So a negative reinforcement, an unpleasant consequence is removed. So in this case, the umbrella is the putting up the umbrella is being negatively reinforced because the unpleasant pleasant consequence is rain falling on our head. We don't want rain on our head, so we remove that. We want to have the umbrella. The umbrella is good. And next time we go out on the rain, we're more likely to put up an umbrella again. But it's not because the umbrella is giving us something good. It's because the umbrella is removing something bad. So it's when punishment is removed or an unpleasant consequence is removed. So we want to be negatively reinforced. It's not the same thing as punishment, although often there is a punishment there that had to be removed for it to be negatively reinforced, okay? Um, so that's positive and negative reinforcement. We're gonna do some um, review of this. Now I wanna talk about primary and secondary reinforcers. So a primary reinforcer is anything that is like inherently reinforcing typically satisfying a physiological need, burnt food, drink, um, maybe you could argue like affection is a primary reinforcer because we have a basic human need for affection. Um, but these are like primary reinforcers. So what do you think a secondary reinforcer might be? Anyone want to put in the chat? What could that be? It's not, it's not a, a, a inherent physiological needs. So what could it be? Like what's secondary? Is it just food that reinforces? It satisfies a want? I like that. Yeah, kind of like a want. I love that, that my kids, that's a good differentiation. I remember when my kids were learning about the difference between wants and needs. You're on the right track, um, but it's more like it's acquired a reinforcing property because we know it's good, like a medal or just the word great or a grade of A or a high five. It's kind of like a want, right? But it's also something that maybe we've associated, right? With um, being good. Let's see, I see more things in the chat. What are you saying? Like what you used to get the prep. Yeah, like sometimes we can use a secondary reinforcer to get a primary reinforcer. What's a good example of that? And a fancy sticker is a great example of a primary. Money, perfect. Money is a great example. Money does not feed us. We don't literally eat the money. That would make us choke, right? But we use the money to buy the primary. Not all secondary reinforcers buy us primary reinforcers because a high five, a medal, a grade of A, all of those are secondary reinforcers that we know are good, um, but they don't satisfy a basic want. But money is absolutely a great example of a secondary reinforcer, probably one of the most potent ones, right? Okay, now let's talk about punishment. Punishment is a pro the process by which a stimulus weakens or the probability of the response it follows. That's all very complicated sounding, but it basically means is when we are punished, we are less likely to do the behavior in the future. When we are punished properly and effectively, we are less likely to do the behavior in the future. And just like reinforcement, punishing can be primary and secondary. So a primary punisher actually like hurts us physically, usually. It's inherently punishing. How many of you have heard the term natural consequences? Don't climb that tree because you might fall would be a natural consequence, correct, right? Like you've heard that. And those are usually primary punishers, right? That, you know, if you do this ridiculous thing, you're gonna get a natural consequence. So if a primary kind of punisher is inherently punishing, usually it's hurting our body in some way. What do you think would be an example of a secondary punisher? Since you already kind of got the idea of a secondary reinforcement, can anyone put in the chat what a secondary punisher might be before I show the picture of one? Being scolded, awesome, great example. Any other examples? What, what grade being punished by a parent, unless it's punishing by a parent could be primary if it's spanking. A spanking is, is, a, prom, is, a, is a primary punisher from a parent, right? But anything that's like, you know, having to sit in a corner, I love it, getting an F, perfect. Something that affects your emotion. A parent saying, um, I'm very disappointed in you. Have you ever had a parent say that to you? That is devastating, right? 
right? I'm so, I'm so disappointed in you. They're like, no, right? Um, so that's are all excellent examples of secondary punishers. Let's see what the picture is gonna show is an F, <laughs> perfect, right? Um, they have acquired, we know they're bad. They don't affect our body directly, but we know that they are bad. Okay, so just like reinforcers, punishers can also be positive and negative. Now here's a brain twist, positive punishment. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? How can positive punishment be positive? But wait, does positive mean good? Does positive mean good? No, positive doesn't mean good. What does positive mean? <laughs> what does positive mean? Adding something, positive means adding something. So if we're adding something that is gonna be punishing, what are we adding? Something good or something bad? We're adding something bad, exactly. Like we're, so positive punishment it's the worst kind of punishment. That's the no. And it can be primary or secondary. So it can be the hit, the slap, the shock, the no, the F, anything that's added to the situation that is bad. Most many, many punishments are positive punishments, even though you probably know to call them positive punishments in day-to-day -day life, right? Because you're like adding chores, like adding a no, like any of those things. It can be primary or secondary, right? Yes, yeah, so you are naughty. So now you need to do more chores. Okay, so what's negative punishment. We're taking away something. And what are we taking away? If it's going to be a punishment, something good or bad? Right, Emma got it, something good, like phones or keys, and you can see it exactly, taking away the good. So negative punishment is when your privileges are removed, okay? Um, something like jail is tricky. Is it positive punishment or negative punishment? What's a jail? Jail's, we can all agree, jail is punishment, yes? Is it positive or negative? Wanna put it in the chat? It's a trick question. It's kind of both, yeah, because you are removing freedom, right? Access to your family, all the great things you like about your regular life, but aren't, you're also adding the negative aspects of jail, right? Jail itself is not pleasant, so jail, has a cone it has both positive and negative something good is being removed freedom something being bad is being added jail so that's sometimes it's not obvious which one it is because sometimes there's aspects of both so great okay now we're going to talk specifically about a type of punishment that you're probably familiar with which is time out so what is time out how is time out negative punishment can anyone figure that out Timeout's supposed to be negative punishment. How is that? What is being removed? Taking away playtime, exactly. We are removing the child from you know, the stimulation. So the kid does something bad, they hit their sister. How many of you have ever been put in timeout? Is that something you're still being used? It takes away your time. However, timeout, what do you think? Is timeout awesome? Is it always work? Is it like the best way of disciplining kids? No. It has problems because, not because it's inherently a bad thing to do, but because it's often misused. So let me tell you a little story. Um, Daniel, you've probably heard this story. I think I told it, you've heard most of this lecture, right? Uh, I told it on my async. It's one of my favorite stories. Now I have to say my daughter's 12 now. This is an old story. This is a story from when my daughter is two, but I just love this story. She, she has given me approval now to tell the story. Um, when my daughter was two, I took her and her brother who is four, was four, her brother's two years older, to a UMW Passover Seder. So the UMW Hillel Society in, um, and I'm sure they'll do it next year. They obviously um, did not do it during the pandemic, um, but have these wonderful Passover Seders where they um, feed you and they read the story and it's really fun and you like pay a little bit of money and you get a great meal and it's great. So I took her to this because it's like cultural awareness. This will be great. And she's, she, there's the person taking the money is like super friendly to my daughter. And she's like, hi, and he's like, hi, and she like loves him. So we go to sit down and she's really happy and she's frolicking around, but now it's time to actually like be quiet and listen to like the speeches, right? The story of Passover. So she has to be quiet. So I'm like, Emily, shh, sit down, be quiet. So she, I make her sit down and guess what she does? 
Danielle yeah, can guess. She smacks her brother, which she is not, well, I'm not saying she never smacked her brother before that, but she smacks her brother. Okay. And, I'm, and first of all, this is in front of like my students. I'm a professor. I'm like supposed to like, you know, show well with my family, but this was embarrassing. So I was like, Emily, you don't, do not smack your brother. You need to go into time out. So I pick her up and I like parade her in front of like all the tables because we were sitting in the back. So I had to go back and I put her in the hallway kind of near the ticket taker. And I sit her there like, I'm like, okay, one minute of time out. She like waves to the guy, take him to the the guy taking the tickets is still there and she's like hi he's like hi and she sits there in the hallway and she's smiling and i'm like okay your time out is over she goes to sit back there next to her brother anyone want to guess what she does immediately put it in the chat guess what she does she slaps him again immediate what emily stop you should not hit your brother you need to go to time out Yep, she wants to time out, right? So I pick her up, I put it over to all the students, I put her down, she waves high, high to the tickets, hi, hi, you know, one minute, you know, time out, it's over, put them back, guess what she does? Anyone wanna guess? She smacks him again. How many times do you think me, a psychologist who teaches about conditioning, did this? How many times would you guess? This is like such an embarrassing story. It was somewhere between four and five times where I was like, time out. I was cousin. And then all of a sudden, I mean, I teach this. And then I was like, oh, this is reinforcing. <laughs> she likes this. I mean, it took me, I swear to God, it's so much harder in the moment to make these connections. So yes, Emma says she says that it's, there was two aspects that were actually reinforcing. I wanted it to be punishing but it was actually reinforcing for two reasons. And you nailed, and one of the reasons is positive reinforcement. And one of the reasons is negative reinforcement. So the positive reinforcement, I think you figured out. What did she like about the timeout? She liked the nice guy. She said, hi. She, you know, she, liked, she just liked the, maybe the attention. She was being paraded across all these students. She loved it. Emma, you're absolutely right. There, the, I, Emma, you said she did not have to sit through the speech and be quiet. Was that positive or negative? That part is negative. So there was two aspects. It was reinforcing. Um, it was positive reinforcement because she liked the attention and she liked the guy who said hi. It was negative reinforcement because she got to escape from the having to sit there and be quiet. She had both positive and negative reinforcement. And I didn't want to be reinforcing her at all. I wanted to be punishing her. I wanted her to stop hitting her brother, but what was she doing? She was increasing the likelihood of the future behavior by hitting her brother every single time because I was very effectively reinforcing her by giving her exactly what she wanted every time she hit her brother. So I thought I was doing the right thing, but I was 100% doing the wrong thing. And you might have seen this in your life when if you've ever been in timeout, sometimes timeout is go to your room. Have you ever had timeout that's like, go to your room? And then like, is your room awesome? A lot of people's rooms are awesome. You're like, okay, I'll go to my room with my toys and my books and my screens or whatever, right? Is that a good use of timeout? No. Right? Not a good use of timeout. And then another way timeout can be ineffective is because it can um, facilitate escape behavior. Imagine um, a kid in a classroom and he's doing his math homework and he rips the book. And the teacher is like, oh, you know, you can't rip the book. You need to go into timeout. So he gets to leave the classroom, even if he has to go to the principal. But what did he just get to do? What did he get to avoid? He got to leave. Closer. He got to avoid the math, right? The class, the work. So time out is good in theory, <laughs> but it is often misused and actually is reinforcing. And that's why it seems like it doesn't work a lot. Um, the fifth time, I think, or the sixth time she hit her brother, I, I snapped her in her stroller and turned her to the wall. Boom. That was the last time she hit her brother. That was an effective time out. That was something that was actually punishing. That was actually a negative punishment and a little bit of a positive punishment because she didn't like being strapped in her stroller. So it was a little bit of punishment. So that I think is one thing you get out of this lecture is why timeout can sometimes seem like a good idea but does not work. Okay, let's move on. We have more to talk about. 
Okay. Oh, now we have a quiz. We have like several quizzes. So clean, I'm going to about four or five of these. I'm going to give you a scenario and you're going to tell me what it is. So type it in the chat. Cleaning the house to stop your mother from nagging you. Let's hear from other people. B, 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 negative reinforcement. You want it, the, you're, you're on it, right? You want to, and we're gonna try this actually a slightly different way next time. We're gonna do what I like to call waterfall responses so that you all answer at the same time. Um, but that is absolutely right, right? So the, the mom is nagging you, right? Which is, which is, you don't want, you want that removed, right? So you're gonna clean the house and then the mom stops nagging you and the nagging stops. Excellent job. Turning down the volume of a very loud radio. Don't put it in yet. Type it, but don't hit enter. And then I'm gonna go one, two, three, and then everyone will enter at the same time. And that way we can see, you know, if everyone has it. So type in your answer. You can either type A, B, C, or D, or just type in the words, type it in. And now one, two, three, enter. Woo! Oh, we got some different ones. I got an A, I got a D, and I got a lot of Bs. So this one's tricky. Turning down the volume, okay? The volume, it's too loud, it's too loud, it's too loud. You turn it down and you're happy. So first of all, is that reinforcement or punishment? It's reinforcement, right? It's something we want. Next time we're gonna wanna turn that down again. Is it positive or negative? It's, it, it's removing a too loud noise. So I think it's more negative than positive. The too loud noise is being removed. That's a little bit more negative. Okay, the next two show or example, don't put type anything yet. Wait till I say go. This example um, is a classic kind of thing that happens. And another reason why um, conditioning principles are often misused is because there's a lot of pressure to use them. So imagine you're in a can in a grocery store and you know how like right at the checkout counter, the candy is always right at like child eye height. Right. And so, and so, you know, I'm sure you've seen something along these lines where a kid is like, I want candy, I want candy, give me candy, give me candy, give me candy. Now, if you're that kid and you're screaming, give me candy, give me candy, give me candy, your parent might give you candy. From your perspective, you have screamed and then you've gotten candy. So, from your perspective of the child, what has happened to you? So type it in, A, B, C, or D, positive reinforcement, negative two, for the, oh wait, I meant to say one, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. <laughs> a, 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 I got a lot of A's. Yes, from your perspective, from the child's perspective, you're being positively reinforced. You're like, and that's not what your parents wanna teach you. Your parents don't wanna teach you the lesson, scream and get candy. But you screamed, you got candy. What are you gonna do next time you see candy? Type it in. Sure are gonna scream, that was a great lesson. Well, how do I get candy? Oh, I scream. Now, why in the world is your mother or your father giving you candy? Well, because your child stopped screaming. From the parent's perspective, don't type in the answer yet, Child, the child is screaming, 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 and you're like, need the child to stop. Please stop screaming, I'm gonna die. You give them the candy, they stop screaming. Your candy giving behavior is reinforced how? Type it in, A, B, C, or D. One, two, th oh, wait, 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 wait. okay, I guess you have. I like the thing where you go type it and then all hit enter at the same time, but most of you are putting B, which is correct. That is negative reinforcement. The screaming stops. This is the problem. The parent doesn't, want to. If the parent were like had their most op logical operating conditioning Skinner hat on, the parent would not reinforce the screaming with candy, right? But in the moment, the parent is just thinking, make the screaming stop. And so they give the candy and the screaming stops. And that's going to increase the likelihood that they would give the candy again. This is the problem. What do you think the parent should do in this situation? Type in some suggestions. Give your best parenting advice. Oh, I like the idea, distract. There's a couple of good options here. There's not just one answer. Yeah, get out of there, remove the, leave the candy area, right? What else? Tell them to wait. Maybe tell them to ask nicely, right? Um, we'll talk about that. 
if you do something, you get it. Like give them a reason. Like if you are good throughout the whole grocery store, you can get it, right? Tell them there's candy at home. These are all really good idea. <laughs> give them something better at home if they stop screaming, right? Let's see if we have any more of these. Let's do one or two more and then we will talk about that candy and I'll give you even some more ideas about what you could do. Um, okay. You got ground, you hit your sister and now you're grounded. Don't, don't type, don't, don't hit enter yet. Type in your response and then I'm gonna go one, two, three, okay? Right? Type it in. One, two, three, enter. D, 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 D. I got some D's and some C's. I think everybody realizes that this is punishment. You're not totally clear if it's positive or negative punishment. So let's think through it. Has something been added or taken away when you're grounded? Usually being grounded is more about um, losing privileges, taken away. The privileges are being taken away. So it's more negative punishment than positive punishment, right? If you were told while you're being grounded, you need to do X, Y, and Z extra chore, that would be positive punishment. But the actual just having your privileges taken away is more negative. Okay, I think this might be the last one. Rushing home in the winter to get out of the cold. You're running and then you get out of the cold and that's so nice. So don't answer yet. One, two, three, answer. Very good. I I'm giving a lot where the answer is negative reinforcement because that is one of the trickier ones. Um, people get that confused a lot, but in this case, the Freezing is like unpleasant and then the running is reinforced because the unpleasantness of the cold goes away. Oh, what, one more. This one's super easy. Type it in, but don't hit enter. One, two, three, go. Yeah, that one's easy. It's reward. Um, bonus, is this, a po is this a primary or secondary reinforcer? So type it in. Gold star, secondary, you're learning so much, yay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we would use operant conditioning in real life. Um, oh, whoops, let me go back. <laughs> let me talk a little bit. How many of you have ever worked with children with autism or know any child with autism? Does anyone have any experience with autism? I want to leave enough time for questions. So I'm not going to play. There's a little video linked here that's about three minutes. Um, but how many of you have heard of applied behavior analysis? So applied behavior analysis is a behavioral technique that is used usually with younger children with autism applying the principles of operant conditioning. Children with autism, people with autism are not as good at kind of picking up social cues um, indirectly, kind of watching what other people are doing and picking it up. Usually skills need to be taught a little bit more directly. And usually those skills are taught um, using the principles of operant conditioning. So when I was an undergraduate, I actually did some applied behavioral analysis with a young child with autism. Um, who really was, was so successful that he ended up, I think, losing his diagnosis and going to college and leading a happy, healthy life. I'm friends with him on Facebook and he's doing great and doesn't really have any autism symptoms anymore. Um, but what we would do is we would, um, we would shape, yeah, I know, it's pretty cool. Um, we would shape his behavior, we would reinforce um, you know, if he would have to say something, if he, I remember one thing where like he couldn't get the word the, like he couldn't get the th sound for speaking. So first we would just shape like stick your tongue out and we would like give him a lollipop. So they would stick his tongue out and then that would be reinforcing. And then we would say like, okay, do this. And we'd uh, stick your tongue out, maybe without the lollipop. And then we'd say, say the, and every time he would do the thing that we wanted him to do, we would give him praise or sometimes food or sometimes food and praise, um, but then maybe just praise because now he would learn the praise is a, is, is a good thing. Um, and we just would teach, we would teach, you know, do this, like just copying behavior, language behavior, and then eventually more and more complicated skills. So um, it's a pretty neat technique. It relies mostly on, um, the use of reward or reinforcement to um, shape behavior. Um, also, there's a picture of a dog. Obviously, you use operant conditioning to train animals too, but obviously animals and people, right? How many, what's the, put in the chat, the most impressive skill you have taught a pet. Has anyone taught a pet to do anything like really cool, like roll over? I mean, 
Roll over, I think it's pretty cool. Fist bump is pretty, open the door. That's awesome. Stay is so hard. My daughter is volunteering now at the SPCA. She's 12, same daughter, like the smacker brother. Um, but now she loves dogs. Um, she's actually doing a project. I, I, I was thinking she should come to this lecture because she's actually going to be doing a project for her scope class on how to train dogs. It's like, you need she should probably come to my lecture, but I think she's still sleeping. Um, no, cats are much harder to train, I'm telling you. Um, although you can punish cats, right? Um, with a spray bottle, right? If they jump on the table, you're supposed to spray them. So, or I don't know if you do that. My cats just jump on the table. They're the worst behaved cats ever. Um, but yeah, you can, you, but cats are harder to really train. But so she's also working to train. She can't, it's very hard to get the dogs to stay. That's where I was going. I was very, it doesn't work. <laughs> Your cat has trained them to give you food because they look so cute, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, the problem with the spray bottle in cats is it has to be very consistent. Otherwise it's not gonna work. Actually, let's talk about that. We're gonna talk about why things fail. We've already learned a little bit about when punishment can fail and succeed. So let's talk about punishment. That went pretty fast, but I'll read through this. Punishment is not something that is the favorite um, device of um, psychologists, but it can work. Um, <laughs> I even have a cat who likes getting sprayed. I don't even know what to say about that. Um, punishment can work in certain situations. If it happens immediately following the behavior, with if it's mild and if it's consistent. So so just like with the cats and the spray, you can't be like the cat has been hanging on the table for 10 minutes and then you're like spray. You have to do it as soon as they jump on the table. Just like with a dog, like I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you've been trying to train a dog and then they might like poop, um, you know, or pee in the house. And then you're like, come home and you're like, try to punish the dog when you get home. Is that gonna work? Is that gonna work? No, it's absolutely not gonna work because the dog is like, I was just sitting here. What am I getting punished for? Like the dog doesn't know. And I know some people will try to like put the dog's like nose in the poop and be like, see, that's bad. But like that doesn't work. The dog gets confused. The punishment has to be immediate. Um, this whole like, wait till your father gets home. No, right? Uh, it has to happen immediate and it's better when it's mild and it has to be consistent. If it isn't consistent, um, they're gonna learn Sometimes I can get away with it and sometimes I can't get away with it. So I might as well keep trying. All right, let's talk about when punishment doesn't work because a lot of times punishment is misused. Um, these are gonna kind of fly through pretty quickly and then they're gonna get dim. So let's just look at them and then I'll talk through them. Okay. So a lot of times punishment is administered inappropriately um, out of anger, right? If somebody, you know, Sometimes that's what happens with physical punishment where it's not like I am now using punishment in a logical way to um, shape behavior, but like, oh, I'm so angry, I'm gonna hit you, right? That's not a good use of punishment because it's not being used appropriately. If punishment is too strong, the person will be afraid. If you smack a dog, is the dog gonna wanna perform for you or behave for you? Or is the dog just gonna be scared of you? You can put it in the chat you're probably gonna say, the dog will just be scared of you and it's not gonna wanna like love you, right? And you don't, and that dog isn't then gonna want to behave or be good for you in the future. So when there's fear or anxiety, um, punishment doesn't really work. The effect is temporary. So punishment might work in now, but sometimes when people are punished, they learn to only do the behavior when they're not gonna be caught right? Like that's not the lesson we always want to teach, right? We don't want to teach them to just <laughs> learn how to get away with it. We want to teach them that not to do the behavior. Um, if it doesn't immediately follow the behavior, it doesn't work. And then it, oh, here, I want to go through here. We can look at these again because it's funky. Um, so they respond if, it's, if, if it doesn't immediately follow and it does not tell you what to do right? Punishment, you're like, doesn't tell you, like, don't be bad. You're like, okay, but I don't even know what I'm supposed to do, right? Like, sometimes kids and dogs need to be told the alternate be alternative behavior. They need to be trained. Kids need social skills. They need to know this is how you take a turn. This is how you wait. This is how you say 
please and thank you, right? They need to be taught the skills. Punishment doesn't teach any of that. It just tells you that what you are doing is wrong. Um, and so that's not really that helpful. And as we said, punishment can prove to be reinforcement, especially time out can be reinforcing. Um, other punishments too, if it's the only way someone's getting attention, sometimes punishment is reinforcing. So there's a lot of reason that punishment can fail. Um, so what are we gonna do? And now let's go back to the kid in the candy store. You had all wonderful suggestions, but um, basically, here are some good suggestions. <laughs> and some of this is the suggestions that you had. Teach the child problem solving skills. So tell them, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna, you know, as we go down the counter, you're gonna like, you know, sing a song to yourself so you get, don't get distracted. Or here's how we take turns and here's how we do that, right? We're gonna reward good behavior. Some of you suggested, you know, tell the kid they can get the candy if they are X, Y, and Z good in the grocery store. That's what we used to do. We used to like say, okay, you can get a cookie at the end if you're like, if you behave well so that they don't scream and get the candy, then they have good behavior and get the candy. Sometimes you just have to ignore the behavior, right? We didn't talk too much about this idea of extinction, but extinction happens when you simply just stop reinforcing the behavior. If a behavior has been reinforced and then it stops being reinforced, it's not, it's just sort of it's consistently no longer reinforced right? It will eventually stop. Do you think it'll stop right away? If you've been like reinforcing your kid for screaming, every time they scream, they get candy. And then one day you're like, I will stop screaming. I will stop giving them candy when they scream. Is the kid immediately going to be like, no, I will stop screaming. No. In fact, what might the kid do first before they stop screaming? They're like, I want candy. And now for the first time ever, you're like, no candy they may actually scream more. That's absolutely true. It's called an extinction burst. Um, the kid might be confused, but they actually might even do the behavior more because they're like, wait, it wasn't working. I just need to do it more. It's always worked, right? So you actually need to, if you're going to tell a parent, just ignore them, you need to warn them and be like, it could get worse before it gets better, right? <laughs> because a parent's going to come in the next week if you're a therapist being like, ignore it. They're going to be like, it got worse. You're the worst therapist ever. You gave me the horrible advice, but you have to warn them. It's going to get worse first, but you have to be consistent with ignoring the bad behavior. But better than just ignoring the bad behavior is to ignore the bad behavior and then to reinforce an alternate behavior. So encourage some kind of alternative behavior and reinforce it. And in parenting, it's a good idea. A good piece of advice is to catch your child being good. Sometimes families get into like real conflict cycles where everybody is just angry at each other and like looking for reasons to get mad at each other. Um, and so in those cases, you what you really wanna do is focus on the times that your child is being good and you catch them being good and then you praise them. I love the way you're sitting still or you know helping your brother. I thank you so much for, getting, pouring your own milk. I mean, anything, right? Anything that they're doing, you try to find a good behavior and reward it, catch them being good. And then soon you'll kind of see those dynamics shift. Um, the last thing I want to do is give you one warning. I've been saying rewards in general are preferable to punishment, but even too much reward can backfire. Let me quickly explain what's happening in this graph. Um, and then, and then I think this is our last slide. I'll be happy to take questions. Um, how many of you have heard of the term extrinsic versus intrinsic? What's an intrinsic reward? If, like, what does that mean? Put it in the chat while I explain this. This is an experiment where they basically were giving kids um, these felt, fancy felt tip pens, okay? That were really pretty cool. And before the experiment, they had two groups. Um, but they all were like, yeah, I love drawing with these pens. These pens were awesome. But then they like randomly assigned the good, the, the kids. Yeah, internal reward. It makes you feel good about what you're doing. It's naturally rewarding. It's um, intrinsically, it's just joy. You do it for the, the intrinsic joy, not because you're getting a reward. So they randomly assigned these kids and the kids on the pink bar were given a prize. They were like, you did the best with these felt pens. You get a prize because you played with these pens. Then the experiment is over and the kids are no longer going to get a prize playing with the pens. And guess what happens? The kids who had expected a prize 
how much are they playing with the pens? Are they playing with the pens? They're the pink bar. So after the experiment, when they're no longer gonna get the reward, they're not playing with the pen. They're like, oh, these pens, I don't get a prize anymore. I don't want these pens. But the kids that never expected a reward and never got a reward were like, these pens are cool. I'm gonna play with these pens. Some of this, so I don't know, does anyone think of an example where too much reward like undermines your intrinsic love of doing something? Can anyone think of an example of that? I can think of a few. But like sometimes when we, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, sometimes, like I'm mixed on this, but if you like pit or, or even reward for grades, right? Or even the very existence of grades sometimes can kill the actual intrinsic love of learning. But sometimes I don't know if anyone's ever like been paid or like for reading, right? And then you think reading is only a thing that you can do because you're getting paid. This used to happen to my kids. Um, Sometimes summer reading programs can be very successful, but it didn't, and it can work for some kids. Um, it kind of depends on the kid, but for my kids in the summer, like in the school year, they would just read to like read. But in the summer, because they were getting prizes for tracking their reading, they would actually only read if they could like track their hours and enter them. If they didn't have like a pen to write down their hours, they would like literally refuse to read because they were like, well, I can't read because I'm not going to get reinforced for it. I was like, but you used to read just to read. So in that case, the reward was back, was back firing. Um, yeah, if you if you get too many rewards, you don't find as much pleasure, right? In just the everyday things. If you're only right for chores, for example, I mean, you know, it, it can work in some families, but in some families, if you're like, I will pay you when you unload the dishwasher, and then you're like, you want to just be like, unload the dishwasher, you can be like, well, where's my money? <laughs> And they're not doing it because they're just helping out as part of the family. They're like, just part of being in this family is that we all chip in together, right? So rewards can backfire if it kills the intrinsic joy. I don't know if any of you know, like people who like love art and like are professional, want, want to draw, but like people who try to make a living out of being an artist, it's not that they don't love drawing anymore, but it kind of puts stress there. And all of a sudden now their art is like something that has to, they have to get paid for it and it can take some of the joy out of it. Does that make sense? So rewards can backfire. If we're too much reward, we don't um, always, we, and we always expect the reward, then we might stop doing the behavior just for the love of doing the behavior. And I think that's my last slide. I don't have a pretty slideshow. So it's I'm gonna unshare my screen and see all of your lovely faces. And I am happy, I think we have a few minutes. I know that we started late, so I don't know when you, we need to end, but I'm happy to answer any questions about operating conditioning, about psychology at UMW, about UMW in general. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, either um, unmute and talk or raise your little hand under participants if you have a little. Um, okay, great question. Chloe, if you want to major in, um, if you want to minor in, I, oh, you in three minutes, you have a noon panel? Oh my goodness, so you may have to go. Um, quick answer to that question, either will work, um, we have both, but to be a neuroscience major, you need to um, take bio and chem. I would recommend that your freshman year, which is very hard to do, but the neuroscience minor requires basically a year of bio and a year of chem because some of the bio, some of the um, chem classes that are part of the minor require both of those as prereqs. So there's some hidden prereqs in the neuroscience minor. Um, the psychology piece is easier to fulfill than the biology piece in the neuroscience minor. It's probably easier to be a bio major and do it, but it's totally doable if you like psych more to do it as a psych major, but you do have to take that year of bio and that year of chem. You do not need to take chem to major in psychology. You need to take um, just whatever science you take to meet your gen ads. Um, you need to take a lab science, I think, in the new gen eds. I am teaching one FSAM I, and one section of abnormal psychology. I'm actually going to be chair of the psych department. So my teaching is going down a little bit. I'm teaching less than typical, um, but I'll be the person declaring psych majors and uh, meeting all future potential psych majors and welcoming you to the major. So um, some of you are in my FSAM. Anyone in my FSAM? I saw that before. I'm teaching an FSAM. Positive psych 
It's gonna be all about happiness. Oh, yay, I'm excited. Um, and I'm teaching abnormal psych, which probably would not be a class that you would um, take your freshman year. Um, usually that will fill with some upper level students. Any other questions? Looks like no more questions in the chat, but we do have many wonderful, fantastic professors in psychology um, teaching all sorts of wonderful, great classes. It's a great major, wonderful opportunities to do research with faculty, great internship program. It's a very, very strong major. I'll do one final brag before you leave, which is that our Honor Society, our Psychi chapter, which is the Psychology Honor Society, has won the award for best chapter in the country twice. We literally probably are the only school that has that honor. I, I, I don't know that we actually are, but I mean, twice we won the award for best sci-fi chapter in the country. That's crazy, right? Like that's so impressive. That's like national recognition, twice. So we have a very strong psychology department, lots of fantastic opportunities, lots of great professors, lots of opportunities to do research. Um, and if you become a psychology major, I will be your chair for the next three years at least. Um, and so I will be the one declaring you and introducing you and all of that. So um, pleasure to meet all of you. I think you have to go because I think that you have a thing at noon. So I hope you all decide to come to Mary Washington. It's a great school. Um, and I think the Zoom is in the chat for where you need to be next. Have a great day, everybody. We good? I think Hi. so. Duke, Karen, do you guys need the link? Do you see where you're supposed to be going? I think we have somebody else join. Pop it in. Oh, no. All right. Awesome. And thank you so much. And Taran, thank you so much for doing this.